New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. Our topic today is the mystery of incarnation. How have we, human beings on this planet, evolved, incarnated from the dust of the planet, in biblical terms, from the atoms, from the molecules, from single-celled organisms into the complex thinking, breathing creatures that we have become. With me is Dr. Richard Grossinger, author of Planet Medicine, author of Embryogenesis, and publisher of North Atlantic Books in Berkeley, California. Welcome, Richard. Hello. It's a pleasure to have you here. You know, there's a sense in which, under the veneer of civilization which we carry about us, our, mm -hmm. our clothing, our titles, we are still so very biological. We, we hold within ourselves the, the history of evolution. It's, uh, there's a, a wonderful phrase that you use, that the, the very silence within us is the silence of all the other species that are not us. And yet it seems as if so, so much of our civilized world is, is an effort to deny that part of ourselves, to, to think of ourselves as somehow spiritual, somehow not really part of the animal kingdom. Well, I think that, I think that an exploration into, into biology, the use of biology as, in a way, a meditation on who we are and on our origins, is in itself a very spiritual activity. Because instead of inventing a spirituality, we say, what, what is it that the, um, that, the, so that the process has incarnated in us? And how has the process become incarnate through us? Um, I could see biology in a certain sense, as, especially when it becomes experimental and begins um, using, using animals in a, in a manipulative way. I could see it as being non-spiritual and corrupt, but just the information itself has a, has a very spiritual quality to it because we, we have to ask not how would the God we imagine or the forces we imagine spiritually have created us, but how did they? and what is the evidence. And one of the things we realize is that it wasn't done, um, so to speak, um, ex nihilo. It was uh, done by starting with material and building other material out of that and then other material upon that. And gradually through using this material and, uh, and, and sort of in incorporating it continuously within itself, that we finally arrive at what we are. So what we are now, could, I mean, it, it must contain everything, in some form anyway, everything that went into making it. And that not only includes the things that it contains positively, like the, our limbs, um, mm -hmm. the, um, the way our brain is located in relationship to our nervous system, but it contains in it negatively, as a silence, all the creatures who have died and become extinct informing us. The way that, um, that we have been shaped has been in response to them as well. It's just that their, um, their concrete form isn't in us. Mm -hmm. So we really contain a tremendous amount of unconscious information. There it almost seems like a paradox in the sense that I know I'm 40 years old, but my body has evolved over billions of years. Yeah, and, I don't, and it's a question of what is it that's 40 years old? So, um, it, it, it's, I guess, the self, um, some aspect uh, of the self. I don't, I don't question that something starts fresh mm -hmm. um, with conception. Um, I mean, that's, that's the whole interest of our individuality and uh, to carry that a step further, individuality becomes individuation. So it's the, that's, our, that's the psychological process of our becoming. But I don't think we can overlook the fact that there's a biological substratum through which that happens 
that's absolutely incredible, remarkable. In fact, um, it would not be too much of an exaggeration to say that most of the, uh, that the most incredible things that happen to us, that the most fundamental part of our existence precedes birth, that we are rearranged, um, assuming that we're, we're us mm -hmm. then, that, we're, that in some form we exist, that we are rearranged almost daily in dramatic ways that we never duplicate again in our mm -hmm. life in the world. It seems as if the younger you go, the faster things change. Like a newborn infant mm -hmm. learns an incredible number of skills within the first uh, year mm -hmm. of, of life. But even before birth, we, we literally go from a single-celled organism up to the stage of, of being a human. Yeah, being. And think of the, um, the implication, the psychological implications of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because psyche itself must emerge in that at some point. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution in nine months. In, in a certain sense, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a little bit um, a metaphor, but um, it is partially true. But even aside from that, um, millions of millions of cell arrangements and rearrangements and, um, and flows of tissue in, in relation to each other, all happening not because, at least according to science, anything is directing it, but because um, it's repeating a pattern that it can't escape, because it contains just enough energy to carry out that pattern, and it's directed through, through it by the materials that make it up. Mm -hmm. And in somewhere in that process, the thing we think of as the psyche also comes into being. Yes. And, uh it's interesting to me when we think of the of who we are that if one goes back even prior to conception we originated in effect from the union of two different organisms biologically yes mm -hmm. um, um, and and yet um, we don't we never double in that sense I mean we're we're homogenous at mm -hmm. least in our uh, consciousness leaving aside for the moment cases of multiple personalities which are a different issue, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think that um, that there would be some question, though, as to whether we, who we are, is associated with the sperm and the, or the egg, or both. There are some there are some traditions, mm -hmm. for instance, which claim there are Hindu traditions which claim that the human being is only associated with the sperm, uh, although it derives um, genetic characteristics, at least when those are put through mm -hmm. modern science, from the egg. There are others that claim that we exist in the egg and the sperm simply fertilizes it and provides uh, um, genetic material for it. And, um, and there are other traditions that claim that who we are, that the psyche doesn't exist in either, but enters it at a point, different point in time depending on the tradition. And it must be very difficult to reconcile any of these traditions with what we know biologically. For example, the tradition of reincarnation, that we, we live a, a full biological existence, uh, shed the body, and then jump into uh, uh, a fetus or an embryo. Yes, well, that, that's a separate concept from, of course, the embryological one, mm -hmm. because there the, the, the issue of self-definition is handled by saying, well, there must be, there must be something other, other than the body that's formed embryologically. There must, be, um, there must be a spirit that it can exist apart from it. And I don't think, uh, I'm, I mean, for, I think that, that, that from any spiritual perspective, you play off that and work towards it and try and understand it. Mm -hmm. But I think in the deepest sense, you don't want to deny the physical reality that lies at the basis of it, because even assuming such a spirit in the most naive sense, What's it doing getting messed up with this body? Why is it getting so intimately involved in this body uh, as to even go through the masquerade of you and me here talking about it? What's it doing here yeah. if, um, if it didn't have anything to do with it? Mm -hmm. um, if it was just a spirit that's uh, you know, passing by or becomes like, associated with it. It's not quite with, like putting on a pair of, cl of clothing is what you're suggesting. No, I'm, I'm suggesting mm -hmm. that, that, it's, that, the, that in fact, um, the biological function is, is a spiritual function. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my reasons for exploring it and for writing about it is that I saw an opportunity to understand um, spiritual issues 
um, outside of spiritual language by simply uh, understanding and describing mm -hmm. the formation uh, of an organism from the embryo. Yeah. Let's, let's just take a look at uh, harsh biological reality for a moment. There are writers who have suggested that if we really look at nature around us, it's a jungle. It's one species devouring the next. It, it, it's, it, it's cannibalistic in effect, and, and that's what we have inherited as, as part of our nature. And our own species seems to be amongst the most aggressive of, of species on the planet. How, how can one reconcile that at all with a, any sense of spirituality? Well, it's not how can one reconcile it, it's that, it's that the attempt to reconcile that is in fact a present spiritual process. And I think a spiritual process which biology suggests and which is worth following. And mm -hmm. certainly some of the uh, more, more enlightened spiritual teachers have, have noted that and, and written about it. Um, Trungpa, Dafri John. Um, For example, what do they say? Um, well, in one way or another, they um, they address they address the issue of the violence in nature as um, as a reflection of the condition that we must have to be in at this stage of our spiritual evolution. That um, that it's not just accidental that we occur in the midst of such violence. Mm -hmm. That 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 it's necessary to, to where we are in the absolute sense. Thus, we incarnate through it, but it incarnates through our desire for it. And I'm being very simplistic and, uh, mm -hmm. and general here in order to, in order to mm -hmm. respond to so the So is the there point. a sense in which the social problems that we are, are faced with, the pollution is just one example, is part of the, the death urge which is inherent in our own biology? Well, um, I, do, I don't want to deny that uh, because, you know, there's interest in saying that too. But I don't know that I call it a death urge as, as much as, um, as you act and there are consequences. And, um, and that's what we see. I mean, that's what natural selection, for instance, tells us about evolution. I'm not sure it tells us that nature, it doesn't tell us first that nature is violent. It tells us that the working from the instincts and energies that are present in the system, certain kinds of events will occur and they'll cause reactions. And then the reactions to those events will cause other kinds of events to occur. Um, I don't think you can jump quickly from a sort of microbiological level to large social problems um, without, without kind of losing something in, in the translation along mm -hmm. the way that, um, that, that blurs the issue a little bit. I think that, um, that social biologists now, um, you know, certainly from the days of Robert Audrey and Territorial Imperative of, or so forth, have tried to make the argument that the state that the world is in today is, uh, should not be unexpected because it's simply a reflection of the underlying biology. Um, I would just, um, I, I would agree to a certain extent and say that yes, it must be a reflection of the underlying biology, but there is also, there seems to be a process by which consciousness reflects upon that and transforms it, even as the science of biology mm -hmm. is a self-reflection. It's a reflection on the human shape and on the shapes within the human shape. And although it's not explicitly addressed to the idea, uh, if I understand who I am, then I will know better how to act, unconsciously it has to be that, um, um, of, uh, apart from its technological uses. Uh, on an unconscious level, that's what we're doing. And that ultimately does lead to the lar back to the large social questions. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense, perhaps, in which our consciousness, the, being the product of evolution, is now a, a force within evolution itself, so that decisions which we make are, may affect our evolutionary future. And maybe on an unconscious level that was always true. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there are even scientists that have argued that. I mean, it's again the case of where, where does mind enter into this, and at what level and what does it mean? If we take the most limited sense, the most limited um, post-Darwinian sense, 
then it's going to be argued that mind is simply a chemical event that's rather frail and feeble in its potential and possibilities, and that, um, and that it simply reflects itself um, evolutionary conditions which led to it. I think that that's a half-truth. I mean, it's something, it's something, it's, a, it's an interesting history, and it's worth looking at right through the development mm. of the primates into the, the first humanoid species and so forth. However, um, it's also, I think, worth examining that, for instance, the human intelligence is not like insect intelligence. It, um, it, isn't, it isn't simply a genetic imprint that, uh, well, other people, some people would claim it is, but I at least will make the point that it isn't, that it, that it somehow is transforming the material of, um, of nature. And I don't think that it has to be seen just in the, um, in the simplistic sense of creating pollution, of developing machines, mm -hmm. of participating in the process of evolution. It also is, 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 I think, doing so on some profound sense. Well, there is a sense in which some of the mystical or occult writers in the field of biology talk about you know, the, the human body being a, a microcosm of the larger macrocosm and that even even celestial influences affect the body, that it's somehow one with it. And I guess one would have to acknowledge that the very fabric of, of our tissue is is of celestial origin. There, there is a, a much larger sense, even if we look at, at the scientific facts, there, there, there are deeper threads that can be you know, exposed. There are, although most, um, most good scientists, you know, so-called good scientists, will make light of that. I mean, they'll say, well, atoms are atoms and molecules are molecules, and so what that they were there in outer space? That, that, that doesn't connect us to the stars, uh, particularly. Um, it's, a, it's a neutral event, and, um, and, nothing is car and nothing is carried through. They might make the same mm -hmm. argument about the uh, human body recapitulating evolution, that, it, mm -hmm. that it's trivial. Yeah. Well, there is that, you know, you, Years ago, um, the argument was raised that ontogeny, that is the development of the embryo, recapitulates, um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which is the evolution of the species. Yes. And it was sort of taught mindlessly for, oh, a great number of years and, and, and even is still taught in some places today. I'm, um, it, was, it was generally um, refuted, uh, is generally refuted in the pure sense by biologists who point out that the process is actually more complicated and that you don't, you don't get anything like pure recapitulation. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get something like a recapitulation of the natural selected events. It's like, well, we don't have to go into the mechanical details of that. I do think, though, that once you've refuted that, you have to sort of say, well, of course it recapitulates it, because where else could it have come from? There's no other place, there's no other origin for ontogeny for us, except philo that is uh, physical origin or biological origin, except in the, in the evolution of tissue from simple cells through um, organisms with layers of tissue gradually incorporated in each other up to us. We may not recapitulate the exact series that leads up to us, and we may not actually be a fish when we're in the womb, or, or um, be the first land animal as the gills disappear and we start to, and we start to breathe. But we are, we are recapitulating an incredibly intense dynamic process whereby um, we were formed mm -hmm. that, that is parallel in some sense to that. Now, in the 19th century, from, from Haeckel, who, um, who advanced the idea that uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, you get some of the more occult, um, like Steinerite views, that, um, that somehow if ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, maybe both recapitulate cosmogeny. Mm -hmm. The origin of, of, the, of universe the universe itself. itself. Mm -hmm. So that you end up with a funny uh, modern version of the Hermetic Law, you know, as above, so below. And um, Rudolf Steiner uh, went through great pains, in fact, to show how um, there was an esoteric evolution of the universe, which is recapitulated stage by stage in, um, in each, um, in each 
um, phase of the development mm. of the organism. Yeah. That is, um, that is the meeting of sperm and egg re reflect an event which happened with moons and planets at one time. Um, uh, in fact, there is there is a certain similarity, but but I mean, in a at least in a metaphorical sense between them, the sperm entering the egg is like a asteroid or meteorite entering a planetary field. Well, Ste Steiner actually carried that through, so they suggested there was a real event once which was transposed into this. Of course, it couldn't be transposed into it the way biological events are transposed. You'd have to argue some sort of profound archetypal connection, some sort of morphology at the core of the universe, which merges um, mental events and, uh, and physical events and, and, and brings them to the same fruition. But um, Anyway, that, that's going back to your, um, your raising the question of, of the celestial relationship. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's probably the, um, the spiritualists, the Western spiritualists, the anthroposophists and theosophists, would probably argue it not so much on the basis that we're made of star stuff as they would on the similarity of um, embryogenic events to planetary events. Um, the, um, the degree to which um, the different stages of the embryo, the blastula and the mm -hmm. gastrula and, and so forth, represents movements of whole worlds. And when one sees these events under the microscope, they, they do indeed look as if you might be looking out of a telescope. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's one of those phenomena which is easily explained on the one hand yeah. and done away with and then not at all easily explained on the other hand. For instance, you could go back to the simple laws of gravity which form circles, which, or I should say spheres, spheroid shapes, mm -hmm. cells, uh, planets, stars. Sure. Um, or and the spiral you can, uh, shapes of snails and yeah. the nebula. Right. Mm -hmm. You can, um, and probably um, you're thinking, because we were talking before the show earlier, about, about Wilhelm Reich's perception in which um, while searching for the origin of orgasm response in, um, in simple one-celled animals, he had, he had a perception that similar energetic patterns occurred in the formation of galaxies and that maybe there was one energy, um, one energy which was at once erotic and, um, and what, what else would you call it? Um, Cosmic. Co cosmic and yeah. cosmological. That, mm -hmm. uh, that, that it was the energy that the that the energy that we um, psychologically associate mm -hmm. with with eros and that Freud named libido um, is also the energy of mm -hmm. of, of hydrogen that uh, that is related to galactic formation and to mm -hmm. the spirals that lie behind planetary systems. Yes, there there's a sense as well in uh, quantum physics today that you know the very underlying ground of, of being within us at a subatomic level is, is one that permeates the whole universe. Even the vacuum of outer space is, are these probability waves of quantum physics and it, that it's somehow we are unified with it. That the notion that we are separate because we are a biological organism, that, that in itself may be an illusion at a deeper level, which mm -hmm. is in agreement with the teachings of mystics, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's been a much paraded around notion. I mm -hmm. mean, prob probably different versions of that idea have gotten more press than any other um, so-called science, mysti science, mysticism, uh, synthesis. However, I think that the real issue of that is that, that idea is that um, it hasn't been absorbed mm -hmm. fully enough. In fact, in fact it's been so... Um, so advertised in a sense, it's lost some of its bite, um, if you know what I mean. I mean, you've heard so much about the relationship between quantum physics and mysticism yeah. that you almost forget what it would look like if we integrated that into, into our worldview. And, and well, it, it goes against the grain of common sense completely. It, mm -hmm. it seems as if there's a biological need to think of ourselves as, as separate. How could we hunt? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, although I suppose the you know in the great unconscious of the animal kingdom, it doesn't stop hunting. Yeah, well, the, you could go a lot of ways with that, but mm -hmm. one one response I would have is that is that probably we know who we are, and that uh, and that we may deny it on some level, mm -hmm. and avoid it, and spend life a lifetime or lifetimes depending on your beliefs, um, 
trying to evade it or translate it into something else. But, but the underlying drive of our lives reflect, reflects it. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, to go back to the earliest theme we talked about, um, we must, by looking at, at um, cells and microbiological processes, have some intuition or perception of that process. We, we must be looking, in a sense, at, at desire in its primal form. Yeah. Although the Freudians who reinvented the word desire for the 20th century don't acknowledge that it comes in at any stage earlier than primary development for the most mm -hmm. part. I mean, you have the odd Freudian who feels otherwise. I think, uh, I think unquestionably, you're looking, you're looking at the raw forms of the instincts mm -hmm. uh, on a cellular level. It may even go back further, perhaps, to the proton and the electron. And mm -hmm. But, but there you're, there you're ju that's a jump that I would call, mm -hmm. at, you know, I would call um, a, an interesting metaphor at this point. Mm -hmm. but, and that's the Reichian jump, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he made that by going from, uh, from amoebas and, uh, and worms to galaxies. Yeah. Uh, and I have been accused in my writing of over-mythologizing that aspect of Reich. Mm -hmm. um, but it is appealing. It's, a, it's, a very, um, it's an unusual vision for him who was so grounded and pragmatic in his work. But I think it's, it's also a, a tremendously powerful vision. Um, mm -hmm. But um, on the other hand, I think that you, um, you can, without even making that jump to the atomic level, um, just going to the cellular right. level, mm -hmm. you end up asking very interesting questions about about our own nature. For instance, um, the the ba the basic feelings of life, mm -hmm. the the um, the things that that we feel are most crucial to who we are, the things we desire, the things we fear. At what at what level are they shaped, and do, and does for instance, the force that operates. Um, microbiologically with sperm and egg, with cells that, o that operate to form tissue, um, is that translated into the, into the erotic on a psychological no. level? That's, that's a deep and a profound question, and I guess it's a note we'll have to end on now okay. because we're out of time. Richard Grossinger, thank you so much for being with me. I really enjoy this opportunity to kind of reflect back and forth between, between our mental, our spiritual mm -hmm. concepts of who we are and, and the very tissues out of which we are made, our biology. It's been great having you with me. Yeah, I enjoyed it, Jeffrey. Thanks. And thank you very much for being with us. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.